I first encountered Matthew Green as one of the most active, articulate, and popular city councillors working in southern Ontario, during which time he was a leading voice for affordable housing. It was little surprise that in 2019 he went straight from city office to federal office, winning the election for Hamilton Centre in a landslide and becoming a member of parliament for the New Democratic Party. He is one of the clearest advocates for worker cooperatives, enterprises that are owned by their workers with democratic participation in the company policy. He endorses a right of first refusal, a potential game changer at a time when Canada faces massive company turnover and a tidal wave of retiring baby boomer entrepreneurs. He is the first federal nominee of Community Wealth Candidates. Matthew Green, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for such a gracious introduction. For those who perhaps do not know you yet or only know that you are involved in working class politics, class conscious politics, uh, can you talk a little bit about your own background and how you arrive at your kind of political engagement? Yeah, such an important question. I would say that for those that have driven over the 403 from Toronto to Niagara, from Niagara to Toronto, they would have witnessed over the Skyway, the industrial north end of our city. And I would describe my community and in particular my neighborhood in Ward 3 as being to the city what the city has been to the rest of the country. So when times were good, we were the working class industrial uh, uh, people who built the city, who, who, who built the country through the hard work toil of turning natural resources into materials that became our manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. And with that came a long fought right for unionization for democratic workplaces that often was met with a violent repression from local business owners and civic leaders. And yet the working class persevered through that and in doing so created a quality of life for our community, which was reflected in the prosperity, the shared prosperity, the distributed prosperity of Hamilton through those times. And then of course, is we, you know, uh, inch towards or leapt towards uh, free trade and globalization. Much of those gains were rolled back through neoliberalism and in a capitalism that stripped away workers' rights, uh, provided uh, opportunities for companies to skirt their obligations through contractual agreements like pensions, collective bargaining, by shipping jobs overseas, by bankrupting uh, local businesses and essentially taking with them the um, long fought uh, uh, entitlements of, of the workers, you know, and, and so when times were tough, it was also reflected in our community. We are very much the canary in the coal mine of a lot of these projects, these, these extractionary capitalist projects that are, you know, manifested in, in the ways in which poverty is, is prevalent here in Hamilton. So today, Hamilton has, um, in, in Hamilton Center, the third lowest household income at $43,000 a household mm. at last census. And so I come to my politics not through uh, theory or through reading, uh, but through observation of people living in deep despair and poverty and through the suffering of my neighbors and in my neighborhoods. Wow. wow. Yeah. I um, I just had an interview with Dr. Gar Alperovitz from the uh, Democracy Collaborative and he was talking about the trend of throwaway cities, of companies that just abandon those, the cities that they were built in. Um, and he was talking about how it's not just a personal cost, it's not just an economic cost, it's also an environmental cost. One of the things uh, uh, people don't think, don't recognize, but if they begin to think about it, it's obvious. One of the things that's happening in many parts of the country are what I call throwaway cities. That is to say, a big company leaves and leaves behind the wreckage of displaced people, displaced housing, displaced factories, and then builds it someplace else. So ecologically, it's ridiculous. I think that's a pretty good place to segue into worker cooperatives themselves. Uh, when I was in high school, um, we took business classes in grade nine. We learned how to apply for jobs, but the notion of being engaged in a democratic workplace was never discussed. It was something that uh, I only learned about in my mid twenties. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about worker cooperatives, why you think they're important, why they should be more central to the contemporary narrative? 
Well, I think that it's no secret that there has been a concerted effort to suppress workers' wages, to keep unemployment high, and to keep opportunities scarce in order to keep those wages low and keep people in scarcity uh, by the, I would say, as a symptom of free trade and neoliberalism, the idea of the, the being under the constant threat that if you don't suppress your own quality of life for the capitalist class, that they will uproot and take their jobs elsewhere was absolutely experienced here in Hamilton Center when we watched the liquidation and the re, the, the reimagination of U.S. Steel and through the process of what was called CCAA, which was a bankruptcy process that basically took away the long fought pen, uh, pensions and benefits of, of seniors and retirees um, as part of a, of a bankruptcy process that ended up allowing the company to restructure, change the name and lose its liabilities. We see it present in Hamilton Specialty Bar when Bain Capital bankrupted a four, you know, a, a, a hundred year old a business that had four generations of workers that had hundreds of, of workers kind of left in the lurch for the simple process of maximizing shareholder value right. on the backs of the people who actually create the wealth. And so the idea of, of a cooperative economy is one which centers the shared prosperity of the labor and not as a function of the extraction of the surplus value but on a redistribution of the surplus value back into the worker class. And what really piqued my interest was projects that started to, uh, conversations and stories that started to come out of the UK out of Preston yes. and the Preston model. And there's a particular counselor there, uh, Matthew Brown, who I had an affinity for in watching ways in which the local municipality was investing in the idea of worker owned spaces. So, you know, during COVID, there was the largest transfer of wealth from the working class through their uh, income tax and, 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 and taxation up to the capitalist class through wage subsidies where companies would take money that was supposed to go to workers and redistribute it to shareholders. So this is part of a corporate kleptocracy, in my opinion, that is constantly centering Bay Street and the big banks and shareholders over those who actually create wealth in this country. Right. And, and, it, and for me, again, without even getting into strong theory, I would argue that a person, a, a ninth grader here in Hamilton would be able to look at what's happened and know that this is fundamentally not a fair, just, nor democratic way for our economy to, to function. And our, if our economy is not democratic, then our body politic certainly is not democratic. Yeah. Something that you mentioned in Preston, um, this was a community that had a, a remarkable resurgence after doing this kind of investment. It was actually named the most improved city in the United Kingdom a couple of years ago. Um, and here in Canada, we have a lot of evidence that the stuff that, that you're talking about um, is very practical. It's actually in French Canada, we have the greatest concentration of worker cooperatives in Canada or the United States. And studies have found that in Canada, similar findings around the world, uh, worker cooperatives are twice as likely as your standard startup enterprise to last 10 years or more. Um, and so this kind of stereotype that a company is only successful if there's a single genius entrepreneur behind it or something like that uh, really kind of falls apart when we check the evidence. When we're talking about building a resilient economy, a, a stable economy, um, worker cooperatives are, are very practical things to support. You know, referencing back to Hamilton Specialty Bar, I was working closely with the local affiliate here for USW. And what occurred to me is that under the company's creditors arrangement act, the very act that allowed for, uh, you know, these types of bankruptcies to happen in this field, um, that there ought to have been an opportunity for the workers to have the first right to continue to make this company be a, a viable and going concern. We knew that they had the ability to produce some of the highest quality, uh, lowest ecological impact steel in the world. Right. And yet, because the ledgers of Bay Street and indeed Wall Street determined that there was more value in extracting for the shareholders than there was for the actual productions of goods, 
Capital One out. And so I think that in these processes of bankruptcy, before people's lives, and when I'm not talking about, you know, a few people, I'm talking about communities, hundreds of people and their families impacted, that workers should absolutely have the right to reclaim their means of production and to distribute the wealth accordingly amongst the, the, the workers of that particular company. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the idea of, you know, shareholders versus those who create the value, then again, without it being too complicated, it should absolutely be the case that we are restructuring our economy to a place that has more shared prosperity. And I'll just give you another example as it relates to, uh, to COVID, that these companies um, that were taking wage subsidies, and I'll reference Imperial Oil, for instance, took $124 million in wage subsidies. And that was, you know, by and large, debt that was acquired by, by the working class of this country. And they paid out over $300 million in shareholder value. So they hoard, uh, you know, liquidity and massive amounts of wealth that in a time of great need could have been reinvested in not just the production of goods, but most importantly, in the protection of their workers during COVID. And yet they, they chose to pay it out in this illusionary um, Ponzi scheme of, of shareholder value. Right. The, the other thing you know, that I would reference is, um, is the ways in which the ultra wealthy, okay, when most Canadians in, in Canada were $200 away from insolvency, Canada's 44 billionaires acquired close to $80 billion in wealth during a global pandemic. If that is not an indictment in the way in which disaster capitalism works to continue to extract from the working class, not just here in Canada, but we have to always tie it back to global supply chains. That if that's the case here in Canada, I would, I would encourage folks to do the research on the amount of wealth that has been hoarded and acquired around the world during this time of great need. Right. So if we're not redistributing prosperity in a democracy, in a time with, that, is, that is most dire, where 30,000 Canadians were sacrificed for the economy, then, then we are having a significant, I believe we're having a significant values conversation about who we say we are as Canadians versus how our governments actually govern. Wow. As we look at a right of first refusal, which is something that you already mentioned earlier, uh, this is a very simple, straightforward policy. It means that whenever a company is going to be sold, or as is the case with many of these retiring baby boomer entrepreneurs is going to close down, the workers get first dibs on purchasing that company and taking it under worker control. Uh, can you speak to why this is such an important game-changing policy for people who are looking for a more fair economy moving forward? So there's so much there. First is, as a former entrepreneur myself, I will just talk a little bit about the significant barriers to access capital. That the entrepreneurial myth of the self-made person is the greatest lie that is told to the working class because it is a a values and a character statement. It suggests that those who are ultra wealthy have, have gained that wealth because they are harder workers or because they have virtues and values that are greater than those that are living in poverty. And it is an absolute lie. It is a fraud that is imposed and unleashed upon the working class. When in reality, it's those who have access to capital that are able to do these things. And that is by no means democratic. We have a cartel of banks in this country that consistently redline communities. I was redlined as an entrepreneur, not given access to capital. When other people, you know, in my same age group who had different relationships uh, with the banks were able to access capital and grow. The second piece is the, you know, the idea of uh, the, the ethics of a minimum wage. And much of the new burgeoning uh, entrepreneurial tech class of, of, of millennials or, or younger boomers came on the back of a gig economy, one that was predicated on skirting labor laws and employment laws in order to not be responsible for the workers in which they were contractually engaged. And you only have to look to all the various apps 
that are out there and the ridiculous valuations that they have. Uber is a great example where as a business, it shows that it loses money, but its valuation is always higher than what it's actually there because of this new potential to exploit workers in, in more technocratic ways. Now imagine a real democratic economy for a moment, one in which the workers were paid not a minimum wage, but a living wage, one in which there was a ratio or a relationship between the maximum earner and the minimum earner. Because I think when we don't talk about, when we only talk about minimum wage and living wage is actually the, the way in which the CEO and the executive C-suite class of the country have increased the concentration of their wealth to places that is, you know, tens of times, hundreds of times higher than the working class. And that's only exemplified, I can't remember what the date is, it might be like January 2nd or something, where the average CEO has already made more than the average worker in the entire country. And these types of obscene statistics basically illustrate the ways in which the exploitation happens here. So if we allowed for first right of refusal, that allowed those who created the value of these companies to actually share in its prosperity during the transition uh, in a real and, and, and meaningful way, then we would lift so many more people out of poverty by their own means, by the way, not through a government handout or whatever the, you know, uh, um, any of the right wing rhetoric that is used to slander working class people, but through an actual democratic process of shared prosperity and I think if we, if we moved our labor laws to a place that allowed for sectoral bargaining, where you know, the franchise class of the 80s and 90s that conveniently allowed for workers to be separated by store instead of within a company, if we allowed sectoral bargaining to happen as a collective agreement process and an arbitration process, then we wouldn't be fighting for individual retail outlets like we're seeing right now, like Lush and Indigo and all these others that are trying to unionize, uh, we would allow them to, to actually have a democratic process that is fair, um, referencing Amazon and the atrocious ways in which they break unions. Well, you know, while Bezos is said to be a trillionaire, you know, if that's not an obscenity, if people aren't seeing that as the gross exploitation that it is, while well, this wannabe space cowboy is already planning an escape while the earth burns, you know, I think that that is um, indicative of the way in which our media is controlled and the narratives are controlled in our country. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's a lot, but I, I get really fired up about this stuff. Feel free to cut and edit it wherever, wherever you see fit. I think I'd just like to um, uh, hammer in on, on one particular point, which is, and you've already touched upon it, I just want to, to um, uh, go in on, hone in on it a little bit more, which is that we are about to see what is sometimes called the silver tsunami, which is that we have all of these companies that were started by baby boomers. They're going to retire or they are retiring en masse. Um, and this of course is causing massive instability for the workforce. The companies are often just shut down, the property is sold, or they become parts of conglomerates and monopolies. Um, and when we talk about the uh, value of a right of first refusal at this particular time, when the uh, amount of the workforce that is precariously employed is massively expanding, and this is one of the trends that is exacerbating that, there is also an opportunity here to go in the other direction, to stabilize the economy by passing down these enterprises in a different way to their workers with democratic control and with the ability to organize those companies in ways that um, work for them and their communities. The somewhat of the panic that I have around the corporate capture of, uh, of our working class economy. And I say that because you've heard me talk a lot about shareholder versus those who create the actual value as a juxtaposition. But if you look at the way in which retail stocks have been um, gamed through derivatives, through mergers and acquisitions, through the liquid, li liquidification of value for shareholder profit, for, uh, for the dividends that are paid out, my concern is that there's actually baked into our economic system, our financier 
system, incentives for these companies to fail through shorts, and as I mentioned, derivatives and other financial instruments that actually hedge for the final uh, late stage capitalism um, vulturing of the last pieces of meat off the bone of the working class person. And so I think like that's the first thing that I would flag is that not only are we facing this, this wave, uh, the silver tsunami, as you've called it, but we're doing it in a way which there are financial incentives for many of these companies to fail. That's a very important point. Very, very important point. And we only have to look at what's happening right now with retail versus, you know, Bay Street and Wall Street investors online to see the ways in which there is no free market economy. There is no free market. There has never been a free market. That is also a fraud that has been thrust upon society in the West in these so-called democratic capitalist countries. Uh, because those, you know, those ideas of democracy and capitalism are actually at antithesis to each other. And so, you know, I'll, I'll give you just another obscene example that's local here, is that when you talked about what I'll call the social mortgage of future debt that is imposed on societies by late stage capitalist industrial companies and economies. I only have to look to our North End to see the ways in which these companies that have profited so much, US Steel, Stelco DeFasco, ArcelorMittal DeFasco, non-union plant has you know, produced more steel now than ever before with a fraction of the workers. In that merger and acquisition, and I referenced that earlier in the financialization of our economy, in that space where the conglomeration of the um, you know, production of goods and, and the profiteering off of goods is concentrated in the ultra wealthy, one of the namesake owners, Mattel, throws a $60 million wedding for his daughter. Last week, the liberal government announced $400 million to ArcelorMittal de Fasco on um, incentives to move away from coal and an environmental remediation. We have Randall Reef, which is essentially the industrial byproduct being dumped into the Hamilton Harbor as backfill, which again is being funded, the remediation is being funded by, by working class people through tax dollars. So, so they, it is the- They pollute it is the, us and then we fund right. them to clean up well. That's right. So when you look on a world that's on fire, I've referenced Imperial Oil, you know, I've referenced all the ways in which climate change is, is going to have a significant impact um, on our economy and on workers. You know, you look at the ways in which throughout COVID, we have socialized all of the risks, the social risks, the environmental risks, well, they privatize the profit all the time. And that's how they get. It's not through hard work that they acquire $80 billion. You know, the Canada's 44 billionaires acquire $80 billion. Because these guys weathered it out on their yachts, on their nesting yachts, while uh, the working class were in the front lines at minimum wage, sacrificing their lives to a, a, you know, a plague that we really had no, no idea about, no end in sight. So I, I know that's a lot to say that uh, the need for a, an eco-socialism, a democratic people, worker-centered, planet-centered socialism that takes the decision-making away from the ultra wealthy few, the 1%, the capitalist class, okay, and puts it in the hands of people is the only way that we're going to stave off any uh, further catastrophic climate change with eight years left in the IPCC report that came out yesterday. It's like that, or, you know, this idea that somehow the ultra wealthy will be able to jump into a rocket ship with a cowboy hat and leave the rest of us behind. Right. It's a, it's a stark picture. Yeah. Yeah. And I wish I could say it was, it was just hyperbole and, and political rhetoric, but these are the realities that we face. The suffering is real. What we see in Canada is only a glimpse into what's happening globally in terms of the suffering. I don't know how anybody sleeps at night. I don't. When I see oceans on fires, towns burning to the ground, cities across the world flooding in ways that are catastrophic. 500 people in BC died of heat stroke. And we're still talking about TMX. 
and LNG and Trans Mountain, like that's really a thing. Right. It is a death cult. And if this sounds extreme in what I'm saying, it's only because whoever's hearing it is not paying close enough attention. Right. right. Yeah. Very well put. Very, very well put. Um, I'm going to try and come up with a question that gives us a chance to end on an, on an uplifting and empowering sure. note. <laughs> um, you can um, edit it in whatever way you want. If you want to <laughs> change the order, we can start off with doom and gloom and then go sure. back. To more sure. Um, uh, how about we just take a quick moment to uh, um, acknowledge that interest in worker cooperatives has massively expanded really since the financial crisis of 2008 with some tremendous victories at the grassroots level. Uh, you mentioned Preston, England and the huge improvements that were made in Preston, England, uh, but really where community wealth building all began, Cleveland, Ohio, one of the poorest parts of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, the community wealth work that had already been building successes for about uh, 13 years continued to expand upon those right through COVID. In the United States, in uh, about a decade, the number of worker co-ops has just about doubled. Um, so do you want to talk about how this is a way forward that a lot of people are, are seeing right now and that we have the potential to coordinate and massively expand this kind of great work? Yeah, if there's any lessons to be learned uh, from working class people during this time, it's that under our current system, much of their future stability and prosperity is, it remains in the hands of other people. And that through the process of, of creating a democratic workplace in, in worker-owned co-ops, in community-controlled production, um, hyper-local you know, prosperity, that is the only pathway through which your, your future can be sustained and secured in a democratic way, one that you would reclaim control over. You know, that we are trading our lives one shift at a time so that the 1% can live in an obscene amount of wealth while the rest of us are struggling. And, and I include the small business class in this because for myself, I had to become an entrepreneur because I didn't fit into this economy. Right. And so being an entrepreneur as a small business owner was part of the process. And then I began to explore what living wages look like and how we can you know, share and expand that way. But um, it, it, it's a recognition that takes us away from political and economic and social estrangement, the, the, the disempowerment of feeling like there's nothing we can do. And again, this ties into climate change. This ties into the ways in which we are accountable around reconciliation with First Nations, Indigenous and Métis, the understanding of the dispossession of the resources and land mm -hmm. of First Nations, Inuit and, and, and Métis nations here is an important inclusion into this conversation that we can work in partnership uh, and we can work in true and meaningful collaboration with our neighbors, both within our communities, but also nation to nation with, uh, with first peoples of these lands. Wonderfully put, really wonderfully put. Um, as we wrap up, I want to first off encourage everybody to follow Matthew Green on social media. He has very open streams of communication. He's really, really good at, at uh, letting constituents know what's happening and what can happen and what can be done. So I encourage everybody to follow Matthew Green. Uh, and uh, I wanna thank you so much for being here today. This was a really wonderful, informative, ins insightful and inciting interview. And um, we're so glad to have you here and to be a nominee for Community Wealth Candidates. I think that there's some great work on the future and I think you're gonna be right at the center of it. We're thrilled to have you here, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on and thank you for such an incredible concept. And I look forward to being joined by many other progressive candidates from across the country.